always a challenge to be, uh, to be the last panel, isn't it? Especially right after lunch. Um, but I'm hoping that the five of us can actually together, maybe pull together the themes that you've heard over the past two days and give you a snapshot of the reviews and the reforms that are underway that will help deliver, among other things, improved overall system affordability. And importantly, how consumers' views can effectively influence the outcomes of these processes and these reviews. Now, there are many reports that have highlighted the increase of energy bills over the past decade, and I, I won't steal uh, your thunder, Bathan, um, by going through the drivers of those bill increases and what the ACCC have found in their inquiries. But I will emphasize and highlight that there are many factors that have contributed to energy affordability concerns. There's no silver bullet on how to solve it, and it won't be solved overnight. Addressing energy affordability will take time, and more importantly, it will take a concerted and strategic effort. And consumers need to be at the heart of this effort. At the AER, it's important that consumers have an opportunity to in inform and influence everything that we do. It helps us make better decisions, and it enhances the transparency and the predictability of regulation. And this, in turn, helps build trust and confidence in the energy regulator and the work that we do. I'd like to highlight uh, three initiatives, or three projects, if you will, that we have underway that will end up addressing affordability and what we're doing to ensure that consumers' voices are heard and that their views can effectively influence their outcomes. Now, the first is to do with the retail markets. In March of uh, last year, we all know that the Treasurer directed the ACCC to hold an inquiry into the retail supply of electricity and the competitiveness of the market, and Bathan will be talking to you about that shortly. In August 27, uh, 2017, August of last year, the Prime Minister met with eight retailers to discuss the rising energy prices. Now, one of the common themes from the outcomes of these two initiatives, if you want to call them that, is that consumers need to have access to simple, accurate, user-friendly and relevant information. That information needs to be in a useful format that will help them make their energy choice decisions. As confirmed in uh, Rosemary, your ECA's consumer sentiment survey, we know that consumers aren't feeling confident that there's enough easily understood information available to them to make those decisions. They're not confident in their ability to make choices in the market. And that switching remains low. And I think your, uh, your survey found that many consumers haven't switched plans within their existing retail company, let alone to other retail companies. So what are at the AR are we doing about that? Now, we've been progressing a number of initiatives uh, and projects in response to the commitments made uh, by the eight retailers to the Prime Minister. We're looking at ways to simplify the energy price fact sheets. Uh, we're looking at changes to how retailers are required to display information about their retail plans on their websites and in their advertising and marketing materials. We're placing new requirements on retailers for the use of clearer and simpler language. And we're also considering how we can make all of this work for consumers who don't want to use computers, who don't have computers. And how are we doing all of that? Well, we have a, a consumer consultative group, and I think that some of the members of that consumer group are with us today. We have formed a consumer reference group, um, sorry, a reference group, and uh, the reason I've made that correction is that it not only has consumers at that reference group, but also retailers. We're also using the behavioral economics um, group um, at uh, the Commonwealth Government and the New South Wales Behavioral Insights Team. Now, those are the, the experts in psychology and behavioral economics, and the people who really, uh, their, their work is to understand what makes uh, people tick. Uh, and these consumer groups are also assisting us in our group, uh, in our work on the Energy Made Easy uh, website. We received funding uh, last year to redevelop the site, and we're putting a sharp focus on increasing its functionality and making it more user-friendly. 
I wanted to touch quickly on hardship because I know that there are many that uh, discussed that yesterday. Um, we have been reviewing hardship policies uh, of the retailers and looking at areas where those need to be uh, improved. This year we're going to be conducting compliance off audits um, across uh, the retailers to look at their systems and their processes to ensure that consumers receive the protections that are set out in the legislation and the rules. Uh, and we're also looking at where those rules might be improved. We need to ensure that retailers are being more proactive, uh, earlier, uh, earlier engagement uh, with their consumers, and especially those consumers that are struggling to pay their bills. The next area I wanted to touch on was with respect to the new regulatory proposal. Um, and it's actually got a, uh, a title that um, we just released um, called Towards Consumer-Centric Network Energy Regulation. Now this is a joint initiative between uh, the AER, the ENA, and the ECA. It's aimed at improving meaningful and effective engagement on network revenue proposals and to identify where there might be innovative approaches to regulation. The process, the project rather explicitly recognizes that energy consumers' priorities and their stated preferences should be what drives and equally be seen to be what drives energy network business proposals and the resulting regulatory outcomes. The project is aimed at improving consumers and the network's trust and confidence in network regulation, as well as increasing the efficiency of our processes. Now the idea here is for network businesses and consumers to identify key issues in networks, in the network proposals, and actually before the network proposals are filed uh, with the AER. And consumers and networks, before those proposals are filed, to resolve them and really narrow down in the end where the real areas our contention are. And that will be what we can then focus on when those regulatory proposals come across our desks. Seeking that upfront agreement that the network's proposals reflect consumers' interests provides greater certainty about what the long-term interests of consumers really are. And this is a trial by doing project, if you will, among the three uh, groups. And I'm happy to say that Osnet Services has volunteered to trial uh, that approach in their upcoming uh, reset. And I believe they've just uh, set up a uh, customer forum, which is established to be representative of the consumers that they serve. Thank you. Last but not least uh, is the rate of return. Um, the rate of return, or the cost of funds that the business requires to attract investments in the network, uh, that's arguably, forecasting that is arguably the most contentious and contested part of our regulatory proposal. Now, it's a significant driver of uh, a regulated network, so if you think maybe a 1% increase in um, interest rates can translate to about a 6% increase uh, in regulated revenues. The, the estimated rate of return, it's a complex and it's a detailed process. And it also involves deliberating in areas where experts in the field actually uh, disagree. Now we set out our rate of return, how we're going to calculate that in a guideline, and we're reviewing our guidelines at the moment. And this time around we're taking a new approach that actually explicitly brings in, uh, brings consumers into the heart of our decisions. I'll just do it very quickly. We've established a customer reference group uh, to facilitate consumer participation and engagement throughout the guideline development process. Now that's for consumer groups that want to get involved but perhaps are not over the technical areas uh, and need some assistance in terms of understanding what our processes are or um, what uh, finance theory or what the, the courts and the tribunals um, have found. So we've been holding uh, many workshops and inform information sessions. We've got a dedicated consumer challenge panel. I see many of our consumer challenge panel members here today, and they'll be providing us with ongoing general and um, looking at where the, the consumer's uh, perspectives are to provide a um, consumer-focused advice on either technical manners, uh, matters rather, and push us in a direction that they find that consumers are most interested.
And finally, we're holding a session of experts. And I, I really try in our lexicon to get away from that term hot tubbing, but that's what people normally uh, see it as. Uh, and the purpose of that is to identify the scope and narrow uh, the relevant issues uh, in calculating the rate of return, identifying points on which views of experts uh, may differ, and importantly, understanding why the views um, differ. We'll be holding a facilitated session uh, in a couple of weeks with those experts where we'll be asking them questions. The benefits of having the experts all together in the room as well is that we can ask them questions on each other's views and on each other's um, findings. And this will then enable us to participate um, and have the, the parties participate in the subsequent analysis of what they've actually heard. Um, in those hot tub panels. And I'm really happy to see that this time around in developing our uh, rate of return guidelines, we actually have consumers right at the table. They've got their um, uh, experts there to participate in that session. Now, there's many more examples that I could uh, illustrate on how we're uh, working to ensure that we've got that consumer voice in everything that we do. Uh, but I think I'll stop there, hand over to my colleague, and more than happy to entertain any questions. Thank you.